Well, good morning, Landmark family. We're glad that you're able to join us in this time of worship this morning. Unfortunately, as you can already tell, we're not able to meet up at the building this morning for worship, but we're glad that you're able to gather together in your homes and join us for our time of worship. Prepare your minds and prepare your hearts as we open God's word, as we sing some songs of worship. And we'll enter this time with a prayer. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you've given us. And even this, through this pandemic, this time of turmoil and strife for our country and for our world, we thank you for your guidance and your strength and your care and concern for us. And we thank you for keeping the landmark congregation as safe as possible through this time of pandemic. We pray that you would allow that to continue to happen. Allow our culture to be able to heal from this pandemic. Allow us to be able to meet together in fellowship around your table in the very near future. We thank you for your son who died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. Because we know that without that sacrifice, there's no way that we could spend eternity with you in heaven. Be with us as we enter this time of worship. Help it to be uplifting and holy and pleasing to you. Sir Jesus, we pray. Amen. I will call upon the reading for this morning will come from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 21. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation 
of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Thank you. 
afternoon, Saturday afternoon, when we are recording this, but hopefully lots of you are having home devotionals in your home with your family. Uh, we have a few people here who are helping us. David Lyon is up in the booth. We appreciate him coming. He said that last week, David, I think it was 187 views we had on the website for the Sunday morning time, so that represents, you know, uh, there's two, there's an average of two per click. That's, what, 374 people? Um, we have some singers here to help. We really appreciate them coming. Ken is here, obviously. Clay is here. Laura Raid is here. Ken has two of his aunts here who are, you hear this good uh, singing in the background. That's not me and Tyler. That's them. And then also we have CJ and Grayson here. We appreciate everybody being here to help us. Um, you might have noticed that, uh, you might have wondered why we haven't had the Lord's Supper or a time of meditation to allow you to take the Lord's Supper yet. Well, the reason is because my sermon is going to lead naturally into that. So if we were having a gathering here like we typically do on Sunday morning, the Lord's Supper would actually be at the very end of the service as opposed to being prior to the sermon. So after we have this sermon, which will give some instruction about the Lord's Supper, then hopefully in your homes, you will have a time of meditation and thought together as we remember Jesus in that special way. I put this scripture up on the board this week because uh, this is a, a scripture that most of us are pretty familiar with. It's one of these in our culture that uh, is fairly well known. Uh, God says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and to give you a future. And this was written at a time when the Israelites were in Babylonian captivity and they were really practicing social distancing. They were five to six hundred miles away from their homeland and they were wondering how long is this going to last. And so God, through this great prophet Jeremiah, he tells them it's not going to last forever. Uh, there will come a time when you will be able to go back to your homeland and then you will be able to uh, restore things there. And he says, because I have great plans for you. And I think that's really important for us right, time, right now. Uh, the situation that we find ourselves in, not being able to meet together, uh, it's not going to last forever. There will come a time, hopefully in the near future, when we'll all be back, back together again. And I think that will give us a renewed sense of just how important that that really is. So let's go to God in prayer as we begin this morning. Our Heavenly Father, as we've already sung about, we're so grateful for the blood of Jesus. We know that nothing can wash our way our sins except for His blood, not of good that we have done, not of anything that we have done. It's all because of Your love and mercy and grace, and we thank You for that. 
We ask your blessings upon every individual and every family who is watching this and having a home devotional. We pray your blessings on them to grow closer to you, closer to their families, and be better servants of yours. We pray all these things in the holy name of Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, we have been studying what the world commonly knows today. They call it Passion Week. And uh, the reason it's called Passion Week is because that word passion uh, simply means the death of Jesus. It refers to the suffering of Jesus. In fact, this word passion is a noun form of the word to suffer that's used in Acts chapter 1 verse 3. And in that verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 3, the King James Version and the American Standard Version both translated the passion of Jesus. After his passion, he was seen by many people after he was resurrected again from the dead. But the Gospels all focus on this last week of Jesus' life. I mean, they spend an inordinate amount of attention on just one week. Uh, we know that Jesus lived approximately uh, 30 years old, 33 years of age. He began his ministry when he was about 30. But out of the 89 chapters in the Gospels, 29 of them, that's one-third of all the Gospels, focus just on one little sliver, this one little week of his life. And so obviously God is trying to tell us, I really want you also to focus on this week because it has a lot of important things for our life. I've, I've put this timeline up here the last couple of weeks, and we've had several people say, you know, uh, I think David's made some adjustments to make it a little bit clearer, and hopefully it is. Uh, we're going to be focusing our time on right here on Thursday uh, when Jesus institutes what we say is institutes the Lord's Supper as they're remembering the Passover. I want to say, as I mentioned before about this timeline, we really don't know exactly which day all of these things happened. Uh, this is a traditional timeline where Jesus was... Uh, gave the Lord's Supper on Thursday, and then on Friday he was crucified. I have read lots of commentaries, and they make good arguments. Uh, some people think Jesus was crucified on Thursday. I've read some that think he was crucified on Wednesday. I've read some that even say he was crucified on Tuesday. Uh, and the reason you might say, I know this is kind of minutia, which is not really all that significant. It's very significant that he was crucified, but what day it actually happened on, we don't really know. The reason they go into this, because Jesus made a prophecy one time that you might remember in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. And he says, as the Son of Man, uh, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so in order to make it three days and three nights, some have said, well, it was Thursday that he was crucified. Some say Wednesday. Uh, actually, if you look at it, it doesn't work anyway. I think when Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 12, uh, the way the Jews counted time, part of a day was considered the whole day. Uh, but the point is, instead of getting bogged down into the minutia of whether it was Thursday or Friday or Wednesday or whatever day, he was crucified. And that is of incredible significance. So what I really want us to think about today is, uh, and all of you at home who are watching and having devotionals with your families, what we need to think about is not so much what day it was that Jesus suffered for us on the cross, but why. And this is where all of us are in the same boat. The reason he suffered is because of me and because of you. It's because of us. All of us are in the same boat. See, the Bible teaches very plainly that when we sin, sin separates us from a holy and perfect God. God is so holy and so perfect, He can't allow any sin into His presence. And since all of us are sinners, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Paul said in the book of Romans, since that is the case, then we have to have some way for us to be made right in God's sight. We're not right in and of ourselves, but we have to be made right. And so, the only way to be made right with God, He can't just decide dismiss sin and say, well, it's no big deal. No, sin is a really big deal to God. And that's why there had to be the death of an actual perfect sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. And of course, the perfect blood sacrifice that was a human being and God in the flesh at the same time, that was Jesus. That's why he had to suffer. And so the Bible says in Luke chapter 22, it says, Then came the day of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to prepare the Passover. 
In Jewish culture, as they were getting ready to take the Passover, and this goes way back to the book of Exodus, which I'll have a couple of verses here in just a moment. But these Jews would have begun, about two days before the Passover was to begin, they would have begun purging all their homes of any leaven that was in their home. Of course, leaven it just refers to yeast that makes bread rise. And all throughout Scripture, there are many references to the fact that leaven is used as a symbol for sin and a symbol for evil. And so they wanted to get all rid, completely rid of the leaven in their homes so that their hearts and their minds could be right as they remembered what God had done for them in a powerful way. This Passover meal would consist of bitter herbs and what these bitter herbs would have reminded them of is their bitter suffering that they went through at the hands of those Egyptian taskmasters in Egypt. There would have also been unleavened bread and unleavened, you might remember from the Exodus story, the reason it was unleavened because they were in a hurry to leave. There was haste and it takes time for leaven to rise and so there was no leaven in the bread and also it was a symbol with, without the leaven. It was a symbol of purity. There would have also been uh, of course wine and then there would have been the Passover lamb itself. And Jesus says, I want you to go and I want you to make preparations. And we know from other passages in the Gospels that they, they had this Last Supper, as is commonly known as, this Last Passover is what it was. They had it in some upper room. And people's homes at that time were a lot simpler than the homes that we live in today. But very often they had two stories. This was very common. Sometimes they would have an extra renter who lived on the second story, like maybe some of you do, and they would have an external staircase to where that person could come and go without disturbing the family. Or maybe there was another family member who lived upstairs, and they could come and go in this external staircase. And so Jesus says, I want you to go there, and I want you to make preparation so that we also can celebrate this Passover meal and remember what God has done for us. And so what they would have done is the head of the household would have taken their lamb for their family. They would have taken it to the temple and a priest would have sacrificed it and drained blood out of it. And then the head of the family would have taken that back home to their homes with the rest of their family and he would have roasted this lamb. And some of the blood he would have taken and he would have put on the, the doorpost and on the sides of the house. Uh, at the main entrance. And this goes back to these two passages in the book of Exodus. The first one is this one. He says, take care of them. And he's talking about these Passover lambs that are going to be sacrificed. Here's what I want you Israelites to do as you're preparing for the Passover. I want you to take care of these lambs until the 14th day of the month. And the month was the month of, they call it Nisan, which is the equivalent of this time of year. It's our March and April. And this is one of those times, unlike Christmas, we don't know when Jesus was born. Obviously he was born sometime. It's very important. But, and we don't know the exact date on the calendar that Jesus was crucified. But we do know it was about this time of year. There's no doubt about that because it coincides with the Jewish Passover. So take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight, slaughter the lambs at twilight. And then they're to take some of the blood and they're to put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. And then he says, on that same night, I'm going to pass through Egypt and I'll strike down every firstborn of both people and animals and I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt because I am the Lord. And the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And this is such a fitting metaphor or connection to Christianity today. When Jesus, when God, who is a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath for people who reject him. When he sees the blood, not the blood of those ancient lambs, but when he sees the blood of the lamb, the lamb of God, when he sees the blood of lamb that has been applied to our lives, guess what he does? He does the same thing. He passes over us, meaning he doesn't bring his wrath upon us, which we all deserve. And that is what the good news of the gospel is all about. Now, I want to make just a little aside here for a second. Uh, 
What the Passover, what they were really celebrating, what they were really remembering, they were remembering God's great deliverance at a specific time when they were in great hardship in the past. They are remembering how God intervened in a decisive and dramatic way in their history when he caused them to come out of Egyptian captivity. And you remember he led them to the Red Sea and he brought judgment upon the Egyptians with those ten plagues. They're remembering the might and the power and the grace and the mercy of God that he intervened in a, in a powerful way at a time when it was very difficult for them. Now... The time that we're going through right now is nothing like what they were going through. Um, but it's also not very fun right now either, is it? I mean, I'm glad to be here with the very few people that we have here this afternoon. But I would much rather be together on a Sunday morning with all of you who are watching at home right now on your computer. And so this is a difficult time. And we can't do the things that we would normally like to do. And there's fear and there's anxiety. And some people are losing their jobs, unfortunately. And uh, there's just lots of stress in our culture right now. Uh, what I want us to understand is, I, I do believe God's going to see us through this. God's going to see us through. He's a powerful God. He's able to intervene in very dramatic ways. I have been praying, and I hope you have too, for God just to intervene and stop the whole thing. For God to intervene and to stop this virus and to end it all and we can go back to normal. Can he do that? Oh, yeah, he can do that. He created the entire universe out of nothing in six days. He certainly has the power. Now, will he do that? Is that part of his will? I don't know. I'm not a prophet and I have no idea. But we do know it's going to come to an end at some time. And I think that what that's going to do is that's going to give us some powerful opportunities to be able to remember and thank God for how he saw us through this pandemic as we're going through. And I think that's one of the good things that can come of this. And so when Jesus and his apostles are gathered together, remember what they're doing here. And this is from Luke's gospel in chapter 22. They're, they're having a meal. They're having the Passover meal. And in the midst of that Passover meal, the Bible says that Jesus takes a cup. And this would have been a cup of the Passover. And they were remembering certain things of the Passover. And then after Jesus takes the cup, then it says he takes bread. He takes this unleavened bread. And this is what they were all expecting. They were expecting him to take this unleavened bread and talk about how they were captives in Egypt and how God intervened. But then Jesus does something that they were not expecting at all. Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, and this is what they were not anticipating, this is my body, Jesus said, it's given for you, do this in remembrance of me. They would have been used to the person who was leading the Passover meal, they would have, were used to this person talking all about that time back in Exodus, and how God removed them from Egyptian captivity. But yet Jesus says what this is all about. I'm giving new significance to this. I'm giving new meaning to this. From now on, here's what I want you to remember. I want you to remember a new way that God is intervening dramatically in the lives of his people. I want you to remember when I'm about to give my life for you on the cross, which would have been the very next day at 9 o'clock in the morning when he's hanging on the cross. Jesus said, this is my body, this bread, and it's given for you. And I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And then it says, there's another cup taken. In the Passover, the Jews, there would have been four distinct cups. This is what Bible scholars tell us. They think the first one that we talked about was the first cup, and this one was the third cup. And so as they're taking this cup, they're expecting Jesus once again to talk about that blood on the doorpost, because that's what they had always heard. But once again, he changes the script. And Jesus says, in the same way, after the supper, after they had the Passover meal, he took this other cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. They were not anticipating that at all. I would almost be willing to guarantee you that when they were gathered around at this little table in this upper room, they would have been looking at one another in astonishment, wondering what Jesus is talking about because they had never heard this language before. He is giving new significance to this Passover meal. And he's saying, I'll tell you what the real Passover is. The real Passover is going to be me. 
And they had no clue what he was talking about at this time. Didn't even understand he was really going to be crucified. They really didn't understand who he was completely until after he was resurrected from the dead. And so we see here in these passages, we see the connection between the Jewish Passover meal and how Jesus takes that as an opportunity from their past to give it new significance. And then there's this passage in 1 Corinthians that we are all very familiar with. Paul is writing to a church that is really messed up. Uh, these people, the Corinthian church was about as messed up as any church you're going to find. I mean, I've seen some messed up churches in my life, but I've never seen one like this. Uh, they were messed up on all kinds of doctrine and all kinds of practices, and they weren't getting along with one another well, and so on and so forth. And even when they had their assemblies together, when they took the Lord's Supper, their, the, the way they went about it wasn't pleasing to God. And so Paul tells them, in the same way also, he, talking about Jesus, he took the cup after supper, referring to what we just looked at. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, because as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, let me talk about this just for a second. And hopefully at home you'll think about this. What does it mean when we take the Lord's Supper, when we take this bread and we take the cup, what does it mean that we are to remember his death we pro and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes? How do we proclaim the Lord's death? Well, I think, I don't know all the implications of what he means here, certainly. But I think what he means is, when we take that bread and when we take that cup, we are proclaiming to the world, you know what, I can't save myself. I need Jesus. What can wash away my sins? The only thing that can is nothing but the blood of Jesus. I need Jesus, who is the bread of life, as he said in the book of John. I can't save myself, and we're all in the same boat. The few who are sitting here this morning and those of you who are out there watching on your computer screens right now, we're all in the same boat. We all need Jesus. And so what we need to be proclaiming as we take the Lord's Supper here in a few minutes in our homes, we need to be proclaiming that I believe that what Jesus did on the cross for me, he paid the penalty for my sin. And he got it right. There's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that I can contribute to add to what Jesus has already done. He did it completely for me. He did it completely for you. And that is what I proclaim. I proclaim it to myself. I proclaim it to my family. I proclaim it to the watching world. I proclaim it to the angelic beings, both the good ones and the bad ones that are watching. I proclaim it to everybody that I trust in Jesus. It is in Christ alone, as we've already sung about this morning as well, that my hope is found. And he continues in 1 Corinthians, he says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. What does he mean when he says that if we eat it or drink it in an unworthy manner, we're going to be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord? Well, he certainly doesn't mean that you have to be worthy to partake it or else none of us could ever take it. I'm not worthy of the death of Jesus, neither is anyone else. We're not worthy of it. I think what he's plainly talking about when you look at this passage is, we're unworthy of the body and the blood of Jesus when we don't remember why he had to die in the first place. The reason he had to die and the reason he had to suffer his passion, the reason he had to do that in the first place was because I am unworthy. I need a sacrifice given for me because I can't do it myself. I can't save myself. And I think this is one of the good things about the format in which we happen to find ourselves in right now. At home right now, you could put pause on your computer screen as we end here in just a second. And you could do some personal meditation and think about what Jesus has done for you and why he had to die for you personally because you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And we all need Jesus. And then he concludes and he says, Everyone ought to examine themselves. Notice he says before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Because those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, they eat and drink judgment to themselves. We need to do some self-reflection before we take of the Lord's Supper. 
We need to remember why it was that Jesus had to die. He had to die because I needed someone to die for me. Because I'm a sinner. Because I need Christ's blood to cover my sins. He says we need to do that before we eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so I love this graphic right here. So before you come to the table, we all need to do some personal self-reflection and some personal evaluation. And I hope everybody at home will do that today. I hope we'll take this opportunity to remember the incredible love of Jesus, His incredible grace and mercy, which is what the Lord's Supper is all about. And to remember how unworthy I am, but the good news is He counts me as if I'm worthy when I put my hope and my trust in Christ and in Christ alone. So to kind of sum all this up, I think what these passages are showing us is this. As we remember Christ, we need to remember to examine ourselves. And that's what I'm going to be challenging everybody to do today. As we remember Christ, we remember what He did for us on the cross, and He was resurrected again from the dead on that Sunday morning. As we remember Christ, we need to remember to examine ourselves. First, we need to remember why He had to do that. He had to do it because of me. He had to do it because of you. Because you're not perfect, and I'm not perfect, and we had sinned. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. There had to be a death. Fortunately, it doesn't have to be us who dies eternally. Jesus is the one who died for us so that we could live eternally. This is what the Bible calls gospel, the good news. That's what the good news is. And so this morning... You're in your homes and you're gathered together with your family. Maybe there's some of you who are by yourself. But even though you may be by yourself physically, one of the great things about taking the Lord's Supper is that does unite us together in spirit. And even though we don't have our whole church family here as we normally do, you're all still our church family. And we have brothers and sisters in Christ all across this globe who are also taking of the Lord's Supper on this Sunday morning. What for you is Sunday morning. And so hopefully right now, we're just going to leave this graphic up here, and you can leave it up on your screens as you, as you partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. But before you do so, make sure that you do some personal self-reflection. Think about what Jesus did for you and why he had to do it. How unworthy we are and the incredible grace and mercy and love that God has had for all of us. That's what we need to be thinking about. And then we need to think about ways which we can show that same kind of love and mercy and grace to other people. I hope this message has been a blessing to you today. I pray for God's blessings on you and your family in this time. Uh, we look forward to being together soon. But for now, this is our new normal and we'll continue to put these lessons up. And we hope they're beneficial to you. Let's close with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus who gave his life for us on the cross. We thank you so much for his sacrifice, who is our Passover lamb for us, who has provided the, the way of salvation, or that true blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. And it is in him and him only that we trust. I just pray for our church family as we are separate right now, uh, having to maintain our distance from one another. I just pray your blessings on each and every person. And I pray that you'll help us as a church to be looking for new opportunities to bless others, to call on one another, to check one another, and to see how we can truly serve at this time. I just pray that you'll help us this morning especially to be able to remember the Lord's Supper in a may, maybe in a way that we've not remembered before. As we remember the incredible sacrifice of Jesus and why he had to do it, help us all to do some self-reflection uh, before we eat and drink of the bread and of the cup. We pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you. Hope everybody has a wonderful Lord's Day.